You know, considering how many PS1 games I play on the regular for this channel, it may come as a surprise to you that even in my downtime, I still like to play PS1 games. Sometimes it's just nice to sit back and play an old video game and not worry about how I'm gonna make a video about it, you know? And while I'm sure you're all dying to hear my opinion on the Stuart Little 2 video game, well, unfortunately some things in life we just gotta leave as a mystery. Although, in some rare cases, I have sat down to play a game with the full intention to just relax and try something new, but then the game ends up being so strange or interesting that I can't help but stop and instead reset into YouTuber mode and within the first five minutes of playing today's game, Fear Effect, I knew this wasn't going to be a relaxing game, but a uh, video uh, game. Now, as far as topics for videos go, Fear Effect might actually be one of the most well-known and highly regarded series that I've looked at on this channel. When the game originally launched on the PS1 in the year 2000, this was one of the most eye-catching games available on the market. Not just on the PS1, but across any platform, really. I had friends talking about it in the schoolyard when I was a kid, and I have friends who still often bring it up as one of their all-time favorite PS1 games to this very day. And for whatever reason, it's a game I just completely ignored up until the beginning of this year when I finally decided, what the heck, why not give it a try? And even though it only took me five minutes of playing this thing to know I was gonna make a video on it, let me tell you, I had no idea how absolutely insane this game was gonna be. So if you've never played this before, Buckle up, because we are going to take a trip into the depths of one of the PlayStation's most beautiful and twisted games, and uh... Sorry, what were we talking about? Now before we kick things off, it's of course time for a little backstory. Fear Effect was released exclusively on the PlayStation in North America in February of the year 2000 before making its way to PAL regions in August of the very same year. It was published by everybody's favourite Lara Croft and Gex hustlers Eidos Interactive, but more importantly, it was developed by an American studio by the name of Kronos Digital Entertainment, who prior to creating Fear Effect, worked on a trilogy of fighting games which were lovingly dubbed by gaming journalists at the time as the Trilogy of Terror because they uh, weren't very good. There was 1995's Criticom, a sci-fi theme fighter for the PS1 and Saturn that is often cited as one of the worst fighting games ever made. Then there was 1997's Dark Rift, another sci-fi fighter, but this time coming exclusively to the N64 and PC, which was better received, but honestly being better received than Criticom wasn't very difficult, let's just put it that way. And finally, there was 1998's Cardinal Sin, a fantasy-themed fighter and PS1 exclusive that undoubtedly was the best of Kronos' trilogy of fighting games. It uh, also didn't review or sell very well. Outside of their fighting games, Kronos also released the 1997 isometric sci-fi title for PC called Me Puppet, which actually looks really cool, but uh, good luck getting it to run on a modern version of Windows. I'll just keep crossing my fingers for a GOG release, I suppose. Anyway, in spite of the uh, mixed reception of Kronos' previous games, one thing they always got praise for was the quality of their game's graphics. I know Criticom here doesn't look all that impressive nowadays, but for 1995, this was some good shit. Kronos clearly was a talented dev team, they just couldn't quite hit the mark when it came to the whole fighting part of their fighting games, and while they were definitely getting better with each attempt, you can only have so many critical and commercial failures before things start looking pretty dire for the future of your company, so clearly they needed to try something new. And try something new, they most certainly did. First unveiled at E3 1999 under the name Fear Factor, Kronos' new game definitely turned a few heads in no part thanks to its striking visual style, incorporating cell shading to give its characters a cartoonish yet highly detailed look, a method which at the time was still relatively unique in the gaming sphere. Plus this time around, Kronos had the backing of Eidos and all of their Gex money. So by the end of E3 1999, the hype train was very much in motion for Fear Factor, uh, effect. 
By the way, if you're wondering what the reason was for the name change, you might think it was due to the TV show Fear Factor beginning to air around the same time like I did. It turns out Fear Factor actually didn't begin airing until 2001, and the real reason for the name change was because Fear Factor sounded a little too close to the name of legendary industrial metal band Fear Factory. And look, I really didn't think I'd get a chance to reference Fear Factory in a video anytime soon, but here we are. By the way, go listen to Demanufacture if you haven't before. It is legit one of the best metal albums ever made. Shit fucking slaps. So, a few months and one name change later, Fear Effect finally made its way to the PlayStation. All four discs of it. Yes, we got ourselves a PlayStation game with a chunky case. And a chunky case usually means one thing and one thing only. FMV and lots of it. So, it'll probably come as no surprise that Fear Effect sets the scene right away with a cutscene as soon as you boot it up. Of all the sensations, pain is the purest, without ambiguity. You feel it, or you don't. I had never experienced pain, but now I knew that I could visit it on others. A pain so strong, so intense, that it would purify the world. I had learned the truth, so I ran. The noise of the funeral didn't mask my assassin's approach. I hoped for a quick death, hoped it would be possible. So I stopped running. I had never experienced pain, and I so wanted to feel it now. I wasn't disappointed. Oh shit. No idea why that happened, but I'm sure it'll make sense later. Anyway, it's about time we started the game. Needless to say, there's gonna be a few spoilers for this 22-year-old game ahead, but if you care about that sort of stuff, just know you've been warned. Also, just to let you know, there are two difficulty modes available, normal and hard, and of course, I chose normal because I don't hate myself. Will that have any bearing on the game down the line, you may ask? Well, we're about to find out, aren't we? Hong Kong. A familiar place in another time. So remember that opening scene? The one with the girl getting her choke cut open? It's uh, kind of hard to forget, really. Well, our game begins 24 hours beforehand in the beautiful city of Neo Hong Kong. Here, we're introduced to two of our protagonists, our main player character for the game, the lovely Hannah, and her partner Glass, a pair of mercenaries who intend to kidnap the daughter of a powerful triad boss by the name of Mr. Lam. His daughter, Wee Ming Lam, is currently missing, but using some insider information from an informant of Hannah's name Jin, our duo here plan on getting to Wee Ming before Mr. Lam's goons do, and then holding her for ransom, a sound plan that I'm sure won't go awry at all. I've got 11 o'clock straight up. Jin said he'd be on the pad. So much for Jin being reliable. I'll go find him. And here we go, we're into the game. And yeah, you may notice something a little odd about this game. These backgrounds, uh, they're actually videos. This entire game, every location, every area, every screen, it's all full motion video. Now, I didn't know this about the game before playing it, I just thought the game had a ton of cutscenes, hence the four discs, but the fact the entire game is essentially a bunch of FMVs that you walk on and interact with, I genuinely thought this was one of the coolest things I had ever seen in a game. Now don't get me wrong, I have seen this before in other games. There were parts in the PS1 Final Fantasy games where you are essentially part of a cutscene and move around during them, or in cinematic platformers like Heart of Darkness, where some of the backgrounds and obstacles you are dodging are FMV rather than just the static backgrounds. But a whole game where every single screen is video, I don't know, that was just kind of wild to me. I guess the closest example I can think of where a game does something like this would be the 1997 Blade Runner game on PC from Westwood Interactive, which did this too to great effect, but that was a point and click adventure game on the PC. This is a PS1 game that's aim is to blend the gameplay of like a tank control survival horror title with the punishing difficulty and traps of a cinematic platformer that's also simultaneously an FMV game. So look, maybe you knew this about Fear Effect, but as somebody who had no idea what this game was all about, seeing something like this for the first time, it just blew my mind. So onto the gameplay, Fear Effect, as mentioned, is a good old tank control banger, only instead of walking around on top of low res static images a la Resident Evil or Men in Black, 
we are instead walking on top of low res video footage. Videos that last anywhere from 2 to 5 seconds and loop endlessly, featuring a telltale freeze at the end of each loop. As for how the game plays, well it's quite similar to most tank control games really. You got a button to run, a button to interact with items and objects, you shoot just by pressing X, no need to hold down a shoulder button in this game, and there is of course a button to quick turn as well. You're not really a tank control game if you don't have a dedicated 180 button, let's be real. Although, that being said, there are a few interesting features to Fear Effect that do set it apart from most other tank control titles. First of all, you can crouch, which allows you to silently sneak up behind enemies and take them out in one hit. And there's also a roll button that allows you to roll in one of four different directions. This is probably the most important button in the game, by the way, but uh... We'll get to that later. And finally, while this game does have an inventory system, unlike most games where you can pause and organize things item by item, Fear Effect's inventory is only accessible in real time and only by cycling through it either to the left or to the right. The square and circle buttons are entirely dedicated to this function and I think a big reason why the game is like this is down to the whole FMV thing. You see, a lot of this game had to be designed around the fact there was always video playing in the background, right? Even something as simple as pausing looks a little unusual for a PS1 game. In fact, the UI as a whole kind of had to cater to this as well. As you may have noticed by now, the game uses a tighter aspect ratio than most PS1 games, which isn't just here to give the game a more cinematic feel, but to shrink the size of the video files as well, I'd imagine. Smaller videos, smaller file size, it's a win-win, right? But that means the UI basically exists entirely within these black bars at the bottom and the top of the screen. Your inventory, ammo, use prompts, even your health meter. The only exception is when you pause or when you save the game, which as you can see, requires the FMV to completely freeze to do so. Also, while we're talking about it, your health meter in this game, not exactly a traditional health meter by any means. This little pulse tracker in the top left corner is actually what the game calls the fear meter. Now, according to the manual, this meter gets affected by many things in the game, getting spotted by enemies, taking damage, running out of ammo, these all negatively affect the fear meter. And if the fear meter drops to red and you take a single hit of damage, well then, it's game over. Conversely, if you perform well in stressful situations by stealth killing enemies, solving puzzles, or finding important items, this will improve your fear meter, allowing you to survive longer in fights. Sometimes you might even come across what's known as a rush moment, which immediately fills your fear meter up to max. Something that is very, very useful, especially when you take into consideration there are no health items in this game whatsoever. So cherish the moments that your fear meter is full, let's just Put it that way. Alrighty, that was a whole lot of explaining just there, but at the very least, I think we should all know how to play Fear Effect anyway, unless you zoned out, in which case I don't blame you, but hey, let's move on. Now soon after you start, you'll come across your first save point, which can be activated by using a cell phone within your inventory. Generally speaking, you should use these whenever you can, and you're about to find out why in just a moment. So after a brief cutscene where we say goodbye to Glass, we move to the upper parts of Lamb Tower and get introduced to our first group of enemies. Now for whatever reason, I wanted to see how easy it would be to kill enemies in melee, and as it turns out, running into them head first, uh, not the best of options. So when you die in this game, you get given two options, reload your last save, or uh, don't. So as you can see, saving, it's rather important. Essentially, you're checkpoints for the game. So if you plan on playing this thing without a memory card, good luck. Now the bad news, every death means you gotta reload into the game, which takes about 15 or so seconds, which to its credit, isn't the longest length by PS1 standards. Anyway, we get back to the enemies and try using a pistol this time, which turns out is much more effective. Aiming in this game is automatic, by the way. Whenever you see this icon at the top of the screen, it means you're locked on to an enemy. Hannah basically has a cone of vision in front of her, and as long as you're within range and looking in the general direction of an enemy, you're pretty much good to go. Nearly every enemy in the game drops ammo too, by the way, so in retrospect, the knife tactic was even more stupid than I originally thought. A little further on we shoot open a window to gain access to the storage room and in here we find a fuse and a lever that activates a crank up on the roof. Did I mention this game looks really good by the way? Using the crank up on the roof then allows us to steam clean a goon just below who was nice enough to leave behind a gate key which then allows us to move further through the area. Feeling pretty confident after all this I then tried to take on the next two guards with some stealth action but uh 
I pressed the shoot button instead of the equip button. Don't know if it shows in the footage, but I was still kind of getting used to the controls at this moment. But hey, we survive and get the red keycard, which means we've made it to the next save point. In this room, we get an update on how our informant Jin is doing. Fuck Jin, who are you waiting for? Please. Who are you planning to give this to? Oh, uh, Jin. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Wrong answer. Not very good, as it turns out. And also our first rush moment, which is denoted by the blue line in the fear meter. So we're back in business. Although, hold up, we have another two enemies to fight just outside this room. So while I'm hiding here, I might as well mention that you can reload your guns at any time by highlighting the gun in your inventory and then pressing the use button. And in spite of me forgetting about this almost immediately, we make it out of this encounter unscathed and with a brand new machine pistol too. I gotta say, this is just a nice game to walk around in. Sure, the video backgrounds are grainy, but I don't know, it just kind of adds to the cyberpunk visuals that are on offer here. The next group of enemies look pretty tough, so I decide to try out the machine pistol. Turns out it works pretty well until you run out of ammo and forget to change your weapons in a panic. Alright, back to the save point we go. Let's try that again. And back to the save point we go. This time, we managed to kill everybody without running out of ammo, which is a much better way of doing things. I wish I had thought of not missing the first time around. As we wander a little further into the level, we're treated to another save point, which are actually quite generously spaced, really, assuming you don't die a lot. After a cool cinematic cut to the next two enemies, we managed to take them out with relative ease. I think I'm finally starting to get the hang of things. Plus, rolling before killing somebody looks pretty cool, so that's nice. Up next, we get a chance to use that fuse we found to restore the power and, uh, murder some goons. <laughs> the path ahead leads up to another quick fight, but also a dead end, so it's time for some backtracking. The power we restored seemed to activate a lift of some kind, so let's go find that. Also, it turns out if you check behind the last save point we were at, you can also find a locker key and a rush moment too, as a little treat. On the path back, we take out another goon real quick and return to this area, which uh, looks a little different than before. This here is our first environmental hazard, which in this game are quite unique because they are all part of the FMV. And as fun as it would be to watch myself get fried like the goons did previously, I'd rather not, so let's mosey on out of here. Next up, we walk by what seems to be the lift that I just activated, but since I can't interact with it, I guess we'll move on and try use that locker key. So we backtrack to the office and whoa, what was that? Honestly, I'm impressed that doesn't happen more often in the game, really. Anyway, the locker is located here and we're treated to a blue key card and more importantly, a second pistol that we can dual wield for our trouble. Dual wielding in this game is great, not just because you can kill enemies twice as fast, but you can also shoot at two at once, stun locking them in the process. So needless to say, guns akimbo, it rules. Anyway, after some aimless wandering back through the level to see if I can find that lift or use the blue key card, which was a massive waste of time, I returned to that other lift to see if I was missing something. And yes, turns out I had to walk onto it. It didn't look like I could do that, but hey, if you wander into things randomly, you're bound to solve a few problems every now and then. Moving down the lift, we enter an area where you can get some wire cutters off the wall. By the way, you see these lights here. I completely ignored these while walking by in my playthrough, and soon we'll find out why that was a big mistake. Next up, we come across a door that we seemingly can't interact with, but moving down the path a little further lets us test out our dual pistols for the first time. You love to see it, and it looks even better when you add a cool cinematic transition and roll into the mix. Up next, we reach yet another save point and finally a place to use our blue keycard. Tick, talk, tick, talk, or you'll start to tick, Jin. Now, who are you waiting for? He's waiting for me. Get her! Wait, Anna! Don't leave me! Don't let this kill me! Alright, that's not good, but hey, with two pistols, we're pretty much unstoppable. You Oh no. All right, mental no, don't shoot Jin. So after a friendly chat with Jin about the ransom money, we might have also accidentally armed the bomb attached to his chest. I'll cut my fee, uh, 12%, 10, 10%, huh? Hana, please, you owe me. Not after this, I don't. Damn it. What? What is it, Hana? The timer, it just started. How much, how much is it say? Not a lot, <laughs> now shut up, Jin. Oh. I gotta think. Okay, okay. Now, we'll sort that soon, right after we pick up some ammo first. That's 
much more important. So this is Fear Effect's first puzzle, where we have six minutes to disarm a bomb attached to a very nervous gin. It's a good thing we got those wire cutters moments ago, ain't it? Now, the thing about Fear Effect's puzzles is that they are generally pretty easy to solve, assuming you've come across the solution to solving them. And solutions to puzzles are usually hidden in plain sight. So, for example, if you're like me and happen to completely ignore a set of flashing lights we previously walked by, well then you're not going to have any idea how to solve this puzzle, and the problem with bombs is that when you mess up, this tends to happen. <gasps> so how did I solve this puzzle you ask? Well, through a mixture of brute force and trial and error. Wow, can't believe I got that first try, how lucky was that? About my fee, Hannah, I was under a lot of stress, so explosive makes me nervous, eh? Give me the package, Jin. Uh, I made a flash disk with all your info on women, including a good place to start looking for her. I locked it in a control panel near the neon sign before that jerk laid into me. And the key? With the jerk. Alright, I'm going for the disk. You'd better go under and go deep. <laughs> yeah, you know, for a moment I thought I was a dead man. Well, Jin's dead, but that was a pretty funny cutscene, so I think it's a fair trade-off. Alright, it looks like that jerk has made off with both the key and lift that we need to get out of here. If only there was a door we couldn't open previously, and a bomb to blow up said door. If anything, I'm surprised that they didn't kill me, let's be fair. So this door actually leads back to the area with the fuse box, which means we should probably go save real quick. I don't know about you guys, but I really don't feel like doing that bomb puzzle again. So we go do a bit more backtracking towards the lift, kill a few goons along the way, and reach the sign entrance, which is now conveniently unlocked for us. So then we go to a very deliberate camera angle and another save point. Up next, we get yet another beautiful cinematic camera angle, which just makes killing these dudes all the more enjoyable. Which means it's time for our first boss fight, and that's right, it's the jerk who killed Jin. And for the most part, this boss is pretty self-explanatory. Use the cover to avoid his fire and shoot him whenever you get an opportunity. Of course, due to the nature of the tank controls and uh, getting stuck on the scenery, that is a little easier said than done. Also, I don't know why the manual says I'll die in one hit if my fear meter drops to red. Clearly, I'm still alive here. Well, for a moment I was anyway. Okay, boss round two. Yeah, I'm pretty bad at rolling, ain't I? Alright, boss round three. Okay, boss round four. On round five, I did remember that I had a machine pistol, by the way. So, uh, yeah, that made things a little bit easier. Alrighty, now with that out of the way, it's time for another puzzle. So the aim here is to select the four correct Chinese characters. And if you walk outside... Yeah, the solution to this one is a little harder to miss than the last puzzle, isn't it? But at least I'm now clued into looking at the surroundings a bit more, specifically for big glowing lights, that is. Anyway, with that puzzle solved, we got ourselves the disc that Jim was talking about. Whoa. Uh Come on, Hannah, hurry it up. All right, and now we're playing as Glass. You didn't think Hannah was the only playable character in this game, did you? No, this game has multiple playable characters, which means it's about time we go find Hannah and rescue her. Now, if you're wondering about differences between the characters, outside of a separate inventory, there's not much really. Although I'll tell you one thing, Hannah didn't have to put up with this shit on her run. What the? Oh shit. Oh wow, that's gotta be up there with the quickest deaths I've had after immediately taking control of a character. Alrighty, let's try move a little bit quicker this time. Now, it looks like we're retreading the same route that we took with Hannah from the beginning, only this time it's uh, a little more dangerous. By the way, in case you haven't noticed by now, this game has a lot of unique deck cutscenes, which frankly, 
is a must for any good FMV game, so even though I'm dying, at least I'm going out in style. So it looks like the only way to get by here is to go over the roof of this building and just try time it right. Let's give it a shot. Well, I guess we're not going back that way, are we? And hey, look, a save point. What a time to be alive. Well, I guess we're trapped in this section now. Although luckily, if we search around, we can find a pipe, which we can use on this gas tank. I'm surprised that didn't kill me, to be honest. And after wandering around, wondering what to do for a little longer than I care to admit, I eventually resort to just shooting things, which of course was the solution the whole time. Oh hey look, we're back to Hannah. So this here should highlight a problem with the whole inventory system, because this is where you would normally pause so you could equip a weapon to fight an enemy, but in Fear Effect everything has to be done in real time, which uh, ain't always the easiest thing to do. At least we get an assault rifle for our trouble, arguably the best weapon in the game as demonstrated here. Of course it doesn't do as much good as we get captured again only a few moments later. My name is Mr. Lamb. You've made two mistakes. First, I have enough resources to find my daughter without uninvited assistance. And second, you should have killed me by now. Well, would you look at that? Glass is still alive. Although, judging by these pipes we have to cross, maybe not for much longer. So this is another section where we essentially have to move to the timing of the FMV. Once we make it to one side of the pipes, we can turn a valve that changes the timing once again, which I uh, didn't time very well this time. The next attempt at least goes a lot better, and we're even treated to a save point mid-run. As a little treat. Cash back. Now that save point is a good thing because we're straight into another battle, and remember that helicopter from before? Well, it's back in boss form. A lot of the bosses in this game are structured quite similarly to this one, where once again, you're technically just avoiding zones in the FMV where you can take damage. It's a little odd really, but I'm surprised by how well it works, all things considered. Soon into this fight, after some trial and error, we learn not to damage the boss. You've got to shoot these banners when the helicopter is in front of them. This only takes away about half of the boss's health bar, but still, half is better than none, which is uh, how mine soon looked afterwards. After you shoot the first banner, you're then going to move to the left side of the screen and do it all over again. Although, if you keep dying, that doesn't really do as much good. After the third attempt, we finally managed to take it down. Dumb bitch. Now even though we get a rush moment which brings us back up to full health, I'm a little worried that there doesn't seem to be a save point nearby. I'm sure the game won't put us into combat with a bunch of enemies real soon. Whoa. -oh. So this right here is an important moment in my gameplay journey because even though I run out of ammo and I'm clearly not meant for this world, I discover that rolling in this game pretty much makes you immune to damage. If you just keep on rolling, there is a 99% chance standard enemies will not be able to hit you, and not only is this really effective and uh, very funny looking, you can also swap your inventory while rolling. Now, this kind of requires some weird claw grip dexterity on the controller to accomplish, but let me tell you, even though I'm gonna die here, this knowledge is gonna serve us very well for the remainder of the playthrough. So we beat the boss again, and as it turns out, if you go to the left here before running into the death room full of goons, you can actually get access to an assault rifle, which would have been useful for obvious reasons. By the way, here's an example of some stealth kills in action. Glass gets the old Thief Classic Blackjack instead of a knife, but as you can see, it is more than effective. Where'd you get that anyway? Sent away. Don't ask me why I thought I could clear the next room using it, but eh, you gotta respect the boy for trying. Anyway, we managed to clear out the room on the next attempt using a deadly combination of assault rifle power and our new best friend, rolling. Hard to say which is more OP. Either way, a save point is a reward for our troubles. Now once again, we've got to do a little more backtracking before we get to Hannah, although the assault rifle at least makes it a little bit more fun. 
My men inform me that this disc Jin left for you is encrypted. You will give me the code. I don't have it. Jin played me. He never told me about a code. Then take it. It's yours. You've paid for it with your life. Our business here is done. You may shoot. With pleasure! Yeah, fuck him up, Glass. Uh-oh, another helicopter boss battle. Although, this one is a little bit more straightforward than the last one, since we just got a shootout at this time. By the way, side note, I love little FMV Glass over here, protecting us while we fight the helicopter. Not that it does me any good. So yeah, at this stage, it's probably safe to assume I'm gonna die on my first attempt of every boss. Or second. Or third. But hey, we'll always get there in the end. Oh shit! That's my girl! Oh, double shit. Yeah, if you're wondering why I rolled backwards there, uh, I honestly couldn't tell you. Clearly it's just my donkey brain acting up again. Okay, we beat the boss once more, and this time, let's not roll like an idiot, and then we're out of here. Go, go, go! Head for the hotel. We'll need to warn Deke, there's a shitstorm coming. Oh yeah, this is Deke by the way, the third member of the mercenary crew and the token Aussie something every group benefits from having at least one of. So, were you both in? Getting hold of Weeming first may be the only way we get out of China alive. Uh, look, Glass, I signed on this gig for one reason, right? The money. We'll still get it. But Weeming is our bargaining chip with Mr. Lamb and the Triad for our lives now. That means we find her first, find her fast, and drop anyone who tries to stop us. Well, that's something then. Right, I'm in. I guess we'll need this. A decryption spike? Here. Thanks, love. What'd you find? So now that we've had a chance to check out the contents of the disc, we get some more information on the whereabouts of Wee Ming Lam. Turns out Wee Ming is searching for somebody by the name of Madame Chen, a person who Hannah here seems to have some sort of history with. Oh. Madam Chen? Someone from my past. Is Jin right? Do you know where she is? Up the Hoxic River, a town called Shanzi. Madame Chen has a restaurant there. Too right. Now we know why this Jin packer brought this deal to you then, Henny. You got a bleeding inside track. Looks like our odds of getting paid just got better, eh? Just kidding, we're actually fine. And yeah, that's the end of disc one, which means it's time for... There's a long shower, eh? She has a lot to wash off. Hey, Grace, look. Look! Anna? Get up here now. What? What is it? Shanzi? No, it's just a fishing village. What a bleeding mess. You know more than you've told us, Hana. Why is this runaway so important? There. Hey, 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 that's her. I'll be damned. Hana, secure the boat and get dressed. Deke, you're with me. This chase has just become a hunt. Too bloody right. Well, here we are in disc two with everybody's favorite new item, wet towel. Now disc two is quite the change from the first disc, not just in terms of environment, but uh, we're also now up against zombies. Well, it is a game with tank controls after all, so why not? Now, I'll be honest, I wasn't really expecting the game to take a turn like this, going from shooting helicopters and triads in a cyberpunk Hong Kong to taking out zombies in a rural Chinese fishing village while wearing a bat tail. It's uh, quite the leap, let's just put it that way. 
So what's cool about Fear Effect is that each of the game's four discs basically represent a new chapter or level of the game. The first disc takes place entirely in Neo Hong Kong, and disc 2 now takes place entirely in this fishing village, and suffice to say, disc 3 and 4 will bring us somewhere new as well, but we'll have to wait and see what's in store for us later. For now, we gotta deal with some very angry zombies. Now while these guys are pretty easy to take out and use melee weapons, one big negative is that unlike the triad goons, zombies don't drop any ammo, so we've got to be a bit more conservative with how we use our weapons. Now that doesn't mean I'm gonna do that, but I should. A few moments later, we swap back over to Deke and Glass chasing after Wee Ming, which brings us to our first section with Deke, the final of our three playable characters. Once again, it's nothing too different gameplay wise, but Deke does get brass knuckles for a melee weapon, and also dual sawn off shotguns, so Clearly, he's the best character. That wasn't very neighborly of you there, mate. You have no idea what you are up against. How you find this funny, then? How's this for a punchline? Like I said, clearly the best. Even getting jumped by zombies isn't too big an issue. <laughs> Looks like you've had a rough night, eh, mate? Wait! We men, wait! And with that, we're back to glass and our first new save point of the disc. By the way, you're gonna wanna expect a bit more jumping around between the characters going forward. This section with Glass is maybe one of my favourite examples of the use of FMV in the game. Sure, it's another simple section where you're essentially just walking by fire, but the way the zombies are just moving around and going to town on the bridge just looks really cool to me. Well, there goes Glass again. By the way, each disc also has a new game over screen, and I mean, considering how often that you're gonna see it, it is nice that they put the extra effort in. The bridge goes much smoother the next time around, since we actually put some effort into studying the pattern rather than watching the zombies. After Glass spots some soldiers across the bridge, we're back to Hannah, whose clothes are now left on a burning boat, but something tells me that's probably the least of her worries. So now we're retracing the pathway Deke took but with Hannah, and after killing more zombies than I probably should've, I'm now dangerously low on ammo. I managed to find a key in one of the huts, but the zombies, they just keep on coming, so I guess it's time for all reliable. Or I guess we can call it roll reliable. Unfortunately, we're down to just our knife now, which uh, ain't great, but it is enough to get us to the door and another save point. Oh hey look, somebody who isn't a zombie. This nice old lady tells us that Wee Ming might somehow be responsible for the zombie outbreak we're seeing here, and the army isn't letting anybody leave the village, which, uh, might be a problem. Aw, oh, come on, not in front of the old lady. Have some respect for crying out loud. Well, at the very least, there is a gun nearby, which puts us back in business in the ammo department, which is a good thing, because there are soldiers outside with guns. Now, even though I just got some ammo, last thing I want to do is be stuck with just the knife again, so I opt for the smart choice and stealth kill these guys, which turns out to be the right call because they drop rifle ammo, and I don't have a rifle yet. Honestly, this whole stealth killing thing is pretty cool, I don't know why I haven't been trying it more. Just, uh, make sure not to mess it up, because then things can get a little dicey. Uh oh. Now, if I was a woman, what would I do to get out of this situation? Ah, of course. Seriously though, this guy's facial animations here are amazing. What a way to go. Hello, Not too long, Deke. I've killed men for much less. Yeah, right. Sorry. So, what you got, eh? Military supply train. Probably loaded with weapons. Well, I'd better have a closer look then. At the train, that is. So Hannah and Deke briefly talk about these paper dolls that Deke found a guy burning a while back. Apparently they are offerings to the dead, some old Chinese superstition for you. Anyway, Deke and Hannah decide to split up and check out the military train up ahead, which means we're back to playing as Deke with his two shotguns. Although it would be rude not to try the brass knuckles at least once. 
So this military train yard, unsurprisingly, it's filled with a lot of goons, and while the dual shotguns certainly make quick work of the enemies, getting caught up against three at once, not exactly advisable if I'm being honest. Also, there was no save point here, so uh, back to the old lady it is. So being the cautious soul that I am, I decided to check around the corner instead of gunning straight for the soldiers this time, and not only are we treated to an assault rifle, but a save point as well. So let this be a lesson guys, always check your corners. Naturally, having an assault rifle makes the soldiers a lot more manageable, so things are starting to look up. That is, until we get trapped in a train carriage with the game's next boss. Safe to say I was a little caught off guard here, as would anybody who's been locked in a train car with an FMV machine gun man. It goes about as well as you'd expect. So this boss, once you have a bit more time to react to him, is pretty straightforward really. You gotta run over to these crates over here and just take cover and then take a few pot shots when it's clear. Now the issue is the timing of this is uh, a little tight and it's very hard to get decent damage off on him this way. Now if you're feeling ballsy, you can kinda just stand there and tank the damage while shooting to stun the boss, which sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Also apparently there are explosives in the train car too and shooting them will instantly kill you, so uh, that's nice. Anyway, eventually the tanking method works out for us, because sometimes just shooting the background actually damages the boss. Gotta love that FMV, baby. Anyway, the boss is kind enough to shoot open the train car upon death and drop his weapon for Deke to use. By the way, this is the MK5 rifle, the actual best weapon in the game, but only Deke can use it, and not for very long, but hey, enjoy it while it lasts. Up next, we gotta gain access to a ladder so we can move further into the train yard, which means it's time for another puzzle. This is one of the more straightforward puzzles we'll come across during our playthrough. We basically just need to move these fuses around to first activate the lock and then finally the ladder itself. Once we reach the top, we get another save point, which is a good thing, because we're about to get accosted by, uh... Who the fuck knows? But they do kill me within seconds, so good for them. My second attempt goes even worse somehow, as I learned that you can actually die by walking off the rafters. Now you think after the rafters experience I'd be extra careful, but in spite of successfully killing all the enemies this time, I somehow do it again. Oh well, four times the charm. Pretty reasonable reaction from Deke, honestly. Oh hey look, glass found Wee Ming. You don't work for my father. So, you are a mercenary? Yeah, the name's Glass. So what am I worth, Mr. Glass? Ninety million in cold and hard. And our lives for yours. So your daddy's not too keen on independent operators. Hmm, I wish I could help you, Mr. Glass. But I cannot. My father has sheltered me from the truth my whole life. Finally, I have a chance to change my destiny by reaching Madame Chen. And no one, not my father or you, will interfere with that. Sorry, little girl, but you're coming with me. And I can be very persuasive. I never wanted this to happen. I didn't know that blood was the catalyst. I was just trying to help. I'm not evil, Mr. Glass. But I've learned that I have the power to release it in others. Uncontrolled and unconfined evil. All right. Well, looks like we're back to zombies again. We'll learn from our lesson with Hannah and try to avoid combat if we can. Only one way to do that. Of course, this whole avoid combat plan only really works if you don't roll into a dead end, which of course I did. You know what, fuck it, the whole path is full of zombies. What can you do? What have I gotten into? Well, we're back to Hannah. That was quick. And hey look, she has clothes now too. Good for her. Thankfully there's a save point here, but as usual, a save point is an omen for a quick death, as I alert some guards who gun me down nice and quick. Okay, back to the old reliable stealth kill. Uh, let's just pretend that was a stealth kill. So this section here involves a little bit of exploration and backtracking, and luckily for me, the first direction I go is the wrong way. A way full of zombies and more guards. It goes about as well as you'd expect. 
So this time, we go the right way and finally get Hannah an assault rifle, which makes life a whole lot easier for us. In fact, it almost made me forget about the whole reserve your ammo thing, probably in no part due to the hordes of enemies I was taking on while searching this area, and also how dangerously low my health was the whole time. Honestly, I spent a lot of time searching for a way out of this section, and the enemies just kept on coming. In the end, I eventually killed a zombie who dropped the key, which meant backtracking through a bunch more zombies all the way to the far end of the village, where I could eventually use the key. Watch out! Well, good thing I say that the train a few moments ago. Yeah, so we've reached a somewhat sticky situation. Hannah's health is about as low as it could possibly be. One hit and she's dead. And entering either of these two rooms, we're gonna have to deal with enemies immediately. Is there a way to heal nearby? Of course not. So we've gotta do this really carefully and also get very, very lucky. And of course, by careful, I mean we roll on repeat until we see an opening to take out our enemies, which is a surprisingly effective tactic, all things considered. Although in the end, this room actually just held nothing but ammo. Probably the same amount of ammo I used to kill everything in it, so fuck me, I guess. The actual room we needed to get into, much more difficult as it turns out. Even with our OP roll ability, there is still the slightest chance that we may get hit, and considering how many enemies are in this room, our demise is kind of inevitable, really. So it's clear, the only way to make it past this room is a steady mixture of rolling, aggression, and sheer blind luck. A combination that will no doubt serve as well for the remainder of the playthrough, and lo and behold, we got ourselves a train key. Now back at the train, once we use the key to get inside, we finally get a rush moment to bring us back to full health, but as punishment, we also get what might be my least favourite puzzle in the whole game. So in the train, we find a 12 digit keypad with 3 rows of 4 that uses a mixture of letters and numbers for its inputs. Naturally, my first instinct is to look around the train carriage and right beside the keypad, we've got this note. Now, I'd imagine most people like myself would look at this note and see the 12 digit code at the top right and think, bingo, there's the solution. So I write it down and get back to the keypad. Now the only real issue here is that since the keypad is in 3 rows of 4 rather than a single 12 digit row, it's hard to guess the correct direction of the input. The obvious choice would be to work from left to right down towards the bottom, so we give that a try and input the code. And nothing. I checked to make sure I didn't make a mistake and yeah, still nothing. Turns out the solution is to actually enter it from left to right, but for some reason you've got to enter the code backwards. I've no idea how you're meant to figure this out without some trial and error, and really, that in itself wouldn't bother me too much. But the process of entering the code is so damn long that it's just kind of annoying, especially considering that it's just kind of guesswork. I don't know, let's just say I'm not a fan. Anyway, with that out of the way, we've now got this train up and running and finally a way out of the village. Also, it's nice for Deke to show up just in time as well, although it looks like there's still a few guards on the train, so let's head up top with Deke to sort him out. Now, I know the visuals here are kinda rudimentary, but I really love the way this whole train combat scene looks. It is really quite impressive for the time. I'll tell you what's not impressive though, Deke rolling off the train to his death. Now at first I laughed to myself, Sean you silly billy, falling to your death once again, what do you like? But that laughter quickly turned to a frown when I realised my last save was before the puzzle. So back we go to slowly inputting that code again. Safe to say Deke wasn't rolling on top of the train this time around. Anna! The bridge is out! The bridge! Oh, shit. Wow, Hannah really loves driving things into bodies of water, doesn't she? Oh no, I'm not letting you get me with the snap cutscene again. Not with my boy Deke. Are you alright, Deke? My bleeding tray. It's probably worth more than this wee bird we're after, eh? And it's all in the drink. It might still be useful, Deke. Watch him, hon. I'm gonna have a look. Okay, so clearly that didn't work out too well, but hey, maybe this fiery train bridge will be our key out of here. Well, the good news is that it is, but the whole incident might have alerted a few guards in the process. Okay, maybe more than just a few guards. Okay, 
Okay, we try that again, get the truck key, and then Glass somehow gets spooked by Wee Ming once again. I do not know how to drive. Take me to Shanxi, Mr. Glass, and once I've seen Madame Chen, I am yours. You can return me to my father and collect your precious money. What happened here? Who are you? I'm hoping Madame Chen can help me answer those very questions. Shall we get your friends? Alrighty, that was disc two. Quite the shift from Neo Hong Kong, wasn't it? Well, I hope you're ready for more wacky fun, because you ain't seen anything yet. This is it? Madam Chen's? Yeah. I was hoping I'd never see this place again. Okay, I'll go inside with Wee Ming. Anna, stay here with Deke and cover our best. I'm coming with you. Not yet. Just in case Madam Chen recognizes you. And that is a possibility, right? Yes. Okay. And you, we have a deal, right? I would rather be returned to my father in one piece. So once I have seen Madam Chen, I will do as we agree. You will get your money, Mr. Grass. Good girl. Let's go. Hey, what happened back at that village, eh, Hannah? Well, you, you, you think there's an answer inside that building? Inside those walls, there's only pain and despair. There, that's her. Yes, child. I am here to see you, Madam Chen. I am Wee Ming. You have been expected, child. And Mr. Glass, I expected you to be dead by now. Oh, damn it. Well, shit. Not a great start for Glass, is it? So Disc Tree is probably the most traditional of the locations we'll come across in the game. Now, it's still full of wacky fear effect enemies and obstacles, don't you worry. But in terms of the area layout and puzzles, it feels the most like a survival horror game. Plenty of winding corridors, rooms to investigate, and a fair amount of backtracking too. But for now at least, we're stuck in a damn storage room with glass. So wandering around this small room, we can do two things. Pick up some cooking oil and also smash a pot on the ground, which alerts a guard to come in and start firing at us. Now I'd say it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the goal here is to put the cooking oil down on the ground to cause the guard to slip and take himself out, right? Well, yeah, that's what we gotta do, but Here's an example of fear effect at its most annoying. Yes, you can use the cooking oil on the ground, but first off, the window to use the cooking oil is very, very short, and it can only be used after smashing the pot, not beforehand. Secondly, some of the areas that you can use the cooking oil actually wastes it. And finally, the area where you're actually supposed to put the cooking oil, the space where you can interact with it, is tiny. So tiny that you might not even think you can drop the cooking oil here at all. This combination of things made this relatively easy section one of the hardest parts of the game for me. Sure, we get to see Disc Tree's fancy new game over screen, but it's already kind of worn a bit thin for me at the very beginning. Eventually, after about eight minutes of failure, I managed to get the oil down in the right spot prior to the guard entering, and after some textbook rolling, we finally managed to take the guard out and free ourselves from this awful, awful room. Although I do suppose the cool camera angle and easy slapjack stealth kill was worth the hassle in the end though, wasn't it? Jesus, wouldn't you hate to be enjoying a nice meal and all of this kicks off? I'd be fuming. Anyway, it's time for another character switch, which means it's time for everybody's favourite Aussie who likes to fall to his death. Just in time for a segment where we can easily fall to our death. This part is pretty tricky to navigate, but it's another one of my favourite uses of FMV in the game too. So the goal here is to walk across this skylight, only some of the window panes are cracked, and if we step on them, well it's game over. Now unfortunately for us, it's kinda hard to see the cracks in the dead of night, but thanks to a convenient spotlight shining down from above, we can make out the panes that have cracks in them, and with some patience and memorization, we can safely make our way over to the next save point. By the way, this is the first save point since the cooking oil room, so if we fell here, we'd be straight back to doing this again. So we got very, very lucky. 
Anyway, after Deke sneaks in through a window, we're back to glass on another fun FMV heavy segment. See these chefs passing food back and forth to one another? We've got to sneak by these guys without getting noticed. As usual, our test run goes about as well as you'd expect. My own punch. <laughs> Now in reality, this part is actually a little bit easier than you'd expect because you've only got to avoid getting noticed in the green zones that are on the ground, otherwise you're practically invisible to the chefs anywhere else. I really loved this part for some reason, it just feels like such a novel implementation into the gameplay. Anyway, now that we're past the chefs, it's time to set off the fire system and take out some guards. There's also a fun interaction here where if you shoot a frying pan, it actually results in an enemy dying instead of you for once. That's nice. This is the first time in the game we get ourselves a shotgun by the way, which seeing as it's a tank control game, is one of the better weapons that we'll come across. Now there's a door in the kitchen that we can't get through as it's apparently for working girls only and clearly that's not glass, so let's move on. Next up, my attempts at stealth quickly get interrupted by some surprise enemies on the other side of the screen. There's also some bonus jank here too, nice of it to make a return. Once we deal with these guys, it's time to make it to the front entrance of the restaurant and let Hannah rejoin the boys. Come on. What the hell happened, Glass? They've got her. Lam and Madame Chen took Wee Ming and tried to put the hurt on me. I say it's time we exit. What about Wee Ming? We can't leave her. Lam's not going to pony up any cash now. We've lost, Hannah. Let's get Deke and go. I'm not leaving without her, Glass. I know what happens to girls here. All right. Ten minutes, then I'm a ghost. I'll check this way. See what's upstairs. Thankfully, we've still got our assault rifle from earlier, so we make quick work of the goons standing in our way. If we make our way back into the kitchen, we reach another save point and an interesting cutscene. Hmm. I'm home. Yeah, this game is just a little bit horny every now and then, but hey, it is a mature game for mature people, so why the hell not? More importantly, this costume change confirms what we've all been thinking. Madame Shen's restaurant is in fact an undercover brothel, and Hannah here used to be one of Madame Shen's working girls, so clearly I don't blame Hannah for feeling a little apprehensive about coming here, and more importantly, this would explain why she is so eager to protect Wee Ming rather than just bail like Glass wanted. Anyway, now that we're wearing our working girl outfit, we can get through the door for working girls. And better yet, we're now completely undercover, meaning the guards won't engage in combat with us. Doesn't mean we aren't gonna kill them, but still, it is nice. So yeah, this brothel, not exactly the nicest of places. Whether it's the dank rooms or the guards being overly aggressive with us, definitely doesn't seem like somewhere you'd want a 17 year old girl hanging around. So, to ease the tension a little bit, it's time to stealth kill a few guards, I think. Not only do the bodies disappear upon death, so it's easy to remain undercover, but we get some ammo for our trouble too, which is a nice bonus. So, after exploring the area for a bit and killing everybody we come across, we eventually move into a room and get reunited with everybody's favourite Aussie. Now quick moves there, Sheila. <gasps> Hannah? Jeez, nice shoes. Not now, Deke. Laminous men are all over the place. They've got Wee Ming. So we get Glass and bugger out then, eh? Negative. We're gonna get Wee Ming first. This is still business, right, love? Not anymore, Deke. Hey, what are you doing? <gasps> a, a wrong room. Sorry. Come on, out. Now. Phew, that was close. Anyway, we're back controlling Deke and are now in maybe my favorite part of the whole game. This room with the dancing girl on the TV. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I was absolutely transfixed by this scene. Something about the dance, the background visuals, and the music completely hypnotized me. It reminded me a lot of that dancing guy scene and It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which now that I'm looking at, I'm finding it kind of hard to look away from. Okay, back to the game. So after, I don't know, five minutes of staring at this, it's time to start exploring some more. Hey, would you look at that? A Cardinal Sin poster. Nice little Easter egg you got there, Kronos. Now unfortunately, since Deke isn't wearing any skimpy clothes, it does mean the guards are gonna wanna kill him, so we're a little more vulnerable than Hannibal's around these hallways. Not too long until we find a save room at least, and some sort of object that seems locked to us for the moment. Although if we revisit one of the rooms we were in with Hannah previously, we find a coin. A coin? 
that just so happens to let us access the previously locked object, which means it's time for another puzzle. So here, it looks like we have a guy that we need to make pose by selecting the icons on the screen in a specific order. Now, I don't know about you, but these poses look kind of familiar, don't they? That's right, the TV I spent way too long watching, turns out that wasn't in fact a waste of time at all, as the key to this puzzle is to copy the moves that she pulls off on screen. Of course, I used this opportunity to go back and make Deke do a little dance just for good measure. Back in the room, we input the dance moves and what do you know, that's another puzzle solved. Hello. Ooh, secret door. Well, this doesn't look ominous at all. Frankly, it's pretty reckless to have torches burning inside a building, but hey, what do I know? I don't run an evil Chinese restaurant slash brothel. Naturally, this area has some new areas to explore and a bunch more guards to kill too. Inside one of the rooms, we come across an elevator key and even a save point in another bedroom, which is much nicer than the previous few we've been in. I think you'll agree. Anyway, near enough to here, we can access the elevator using the key we just got, which takes us down into the basement. The room right next to the elevator has a wrench we can pick up, and after we roll down some stairs, we make our way down to a steamy steam room, with some goons to take out. This steam unsurprisingly damages us, but if we equip the wrench and interact with it at the right moment, we can fix the boiler, which activates a fountain somewhere else in the building. We should probably try to find that, I guess. This also lets us pick up the Madame room key. So back we go up the lift into the main room, which is now once again populated by goons and back to the save room slash bedroom, because I don't want to have to play any of that again. Now, at this moment in time, I think we've gone through enough of the game to really get a feel for the overall look and presentation of it. So let's take a brief moment to talk about that, shall we? Now, I don't know about you guys, but Fear Effect might genuinely be one of my favourite implementations of the old FMV style into any video game. I know the backgrounds here might not have aged the best, it's certainly rather grainy at times, and on some of the screens, it does feature some glaringly short loops, but considering that the stuff is being streamed from a memory-strapped PS1 disc, the use of FMV here is used not just to create fun sequences and in-game obstacles, but to really just enhance the atmosphere of the environments that you traverse throughout the game. I'm a firm believer that the static backgrounds seen in many of these early tank control games still look pretty great, and depending on the game, I'd argue they can allow for some of the coolest looking environments that you'll see during the era. Fear Effect, on the other hand, takes what was so good about these backgrounds and adds all these little touches, some subtle moving parts, an extra bit of lighting here and there that really just up the atmosphere during so many of the scenes and locations of the game. I do think Fear Effect is at its strongest visually during the opening disc in Neo Hong Kong, but that's not to say places like the Fishing Village and Madame Shen's don't have some eye-catching standouts as well. As far as PS1 games go, this has got to be one of the most visually impressive titles on the platform, hands down. So much so that even as a newcomer to the game, it's kind of blowing me away all these years later in 2022. And that's not even taken into consideration the character models, which themselves are incredibly impressive in their own right. The contrast of the cel-shaded characters against these FMV backdrops is a match made in heaven, really. I'd imagine since the game's environments are all streamed from the disc itself, it likely gives the PS1 more memory to dedicate solely to the character models. And I mean, look at these guys. These have to be some of, if not the most expressive and detailed facial animations in any PS1 game. Sure, they're not always perfect, but a lot of this stuff is better than what you'd see in games generations ahead of this thing. It's really, really impressive across the board. And speaking of characters, I also need to take a moment to highlight the quality of the music and sound in this game. As you've already seen, the game is fully voiced and by PS1 standards, the cast here is putting in a tremendous job across the board. Outside of games like Metal Gear Solid, you'd often associate the PS1 with some delightfully cheesy voice acting, but Fear Effect here 
is one of the good ones. And I suppose while the visuals are clearly at the forefront of what makes Fear Effects so appealing, I'd say the music and sound effects are really maybe the game's unsung hero. As I mentioned before, Fear Effect is a game that is very heavy in atmosphere, and a big part of this is how well the soundtrack complements the environments you're in. You've got some locations that rely entirely on background ambience, Then you've got some areas with more sinister themes that kind of add a sense of dread to the scenes at hand. Now if I'm being honest, when I played through this thing the first time around, the soundtrack didn't exactly pop out at me all that much, but it's one of those things that I can remember so vividly after playing it, I think it actually had a much bigger impact than I originally thought, which if anything is a credit to the power in its subtlety. Also the game's main theme is a bit of a banger, and that always helps. So that's the end of our little fear effect break to talk about how pretty it looks and nice it sounds. And if you're wondering why I chose here to talk about it, well this is where the game takes a bit of an extreme shift, starting as soon as you use the madame key to enter into her room. Well, I hope Deke's okay. Anyway, back to glass, and as we're thrown immediately into combat, it's time for some rolling until I can get my bearings. There we go, much better. Once again, as is tradition with glass, we've got to backtrack through the environments we previously played through with the other characters. Oh yeah. Probably should have killed that guard at the door with Hannah when I had the chance. Now there are a few new guards moseying about since the last time we were here, and one of them drops the lounge key, giving us access to a previously locked room from before. Once we kill the guards in here, we come across two doors, one of which is locked, so let's take the only one we can go through and keep on moving. This route of course leads us to more goons, but also the fountain that reactivated with Deke down in the basement, although there doesn't seem to be anything we can do here for now, so on the way back out of the lounge, I came across another door I previously missed, which leads us to maybe the toughest boss fight in the whole game. Oh, please don't hurt me. I beg you, please don't hurt me. I'll do anything you want. Please. So this was your secret, huh? Where's the girl? I don't know. I don't know anything. Take your things and get out before you get hurt. Oh, oh. Say hello to the man under the bed. I'm not sure if that's his real name, but for the purpose of this video, that's what we're gonna call him. Once again, this boss is another variant of the classic dodge the FMV gunfire, only this time, it's basically in a C pattern around this bed. The game is nice enough to let you know where the gunfire is gonna be next, thanks to the little red dot on the ground, but it's moving a little quicker than my tank control friend here can muster, let's just put it that way. So to damage this boss, we've gotta take advantage of a very brief window in between the shot patterns. The reason why this boss is so tough is that it requires probably the quickest reflexes and controller dexterity out of any boss in the game, and it's something you really can't just bash your head into until you win. You actually have to try hard during this one. But hey, after a few deaths, we eventually managed to make it in the end. Everybody gets one chance with me. If I see you again, I'll kill you. Thank you for 
next door to me, Mr. Glass. Come between me and my daughter. Separate me from my flesh. Well, Mr. Glass, how does it feel to be separated from yours? <laughs> Well, shit, that was gruesome. But I do gotta give props to Mr. Lamb for that flesh line, though. That was pretty cold. Anyway, now that Deke is, uh, missing and Glass is down an arm, it's back to scantily clad Hannah, who I'm kinda worried for, not gonna lie. So, we're back in the main hallways again, only this time, some of the rooms have new items we need to collect, including this white vase in one of the dressing rooms. Killing the guard near the lounge once again gives us another lounge key, so... I guess you know where we're going to next. Once we're there, we're greeted by a few other scantily clad ladies, including the one Glass just had a run in with, but Hannah quickly scares them off, so we don't have to worry about any of them potential bedmen coming to get us. If we go back to the fountain room with Hannah, this time we can actually interact with it, which gives us a flower. On the way back, we kill some newly spawned goons, one of which drops the office key, allowing us into that other previously locked room from before. The office gives us an access point to the elevator, which allows us to reach the floor at Madame Shen's room and the bedroom save point. And not only that, Hannah can interact with the shelf in the bedroom to get herself a black vase for her trouble too, thus completing her lovely vase collection, which is a good thing, because we need both of these for the next puzzle. So we want to reach Madame Chen, right? But since Deke still has the key, we'll need to find another way in. Luckily, these vases are the answer. Now, this puzzle took me a few moments to get, but it's actually pretty straightforward. You have a white vase and a black vase that you can put on either pedestal and then put a selection of flowers into each. Now, if you look closely at the door, you'll see the tree on the left side is healthy and blossoming, while the tree on the right it's uh, very much not. This means you want to add the white vase with a healthy flower on the left side and the black vase with a wilting flower on the right. And there you go. Puzzle solved. Alrighty, time for the game to go to hell. Deke? Deke! <gasps> I know you. No, you used me, May you? Oh yes, <laughs> sweet Mayun, my child, you've returned after all these years. Mayun is dead. You killed her when you brought me here. What have you done with Wei Ming? <laughs> She's left with her father. <laughs> this cannot be true. Wei Ming, in time, I hope to tell you the truth. You used this evil pact with Yim Lao Wang to bring you wealth and power, but me? You don't scare me. No. How about now? Okay, so, a few things. Deke, clearly dead, but not just dead. That might be one of the most grisly video game deaths, uh, ever. I mean, Jesus, the poor guy. And also, yeah, Madame Shen is a demon, and Wee Ming might be involved with a pact her father made with the King of Hell, and if she gets splashed by blood, she turns everybody around her into demons too, so... Yeah, that's uh, quite something, isn't it? Now, this part of the game might be the most difficult in the entire thing because the demon girls, not only are they really aggressive and have a uh, erratic movement, but they take more bullets than a usual enemy to take out too. By the way, quite the pose you've got there, Hannah. I've got to say. Of course, moving back through the level, the game trolls a lot of these demons at us, and while our old friend Rolling very much comes in handy, we're about to experience an extreme ammo shortage, mostly because of my inept aiming and inability to reserve ammo, but let me tell you, if there was ever a time to run out of ammo, this right here is absolutely not the place to do it. Somehow, we managed to roll and knife our way out of this situation and reach a save point, but considering my dicey ammo situation, let's just try to avoid any combat if we can for the time being. Once we reach the stairs back to the kitchen, we get a cutscene showing Wee Ming escaping into a freezer. So, you ready to leave? 
help me down from here. <laughs> I'll give you a discount on my finder's fee. <laughs> Your old man. I was surprised he didn't finish me off. I think he wants to kill me slowly. I am sorry. Is this the work of Satan? No. Not Satan or the devil. In our culture, he is known as Yim Lao Wang, the king of hell. <coughs> we believe that when we die, we are sent to hell. Our souls may have to wait years, decades, before we are finally granted our moment with Yim Lao Wang. That is why you burn offerings to the dead? Yes, to provide comfort for these souls while they wait. But throughout the ages, the Fongans have made a pact with Yim Lao Wang. <coughs> offerings of paper that should be made real in hell are instead made real on earth. That is how my father has accumulated such great wealth. He truly has money to burn. And what does Yim La Wong get in return? Me. Two weeks ago, my father tried to tell me the truth that I had long suspected. That I was different. That I had a higher power. That on the final hour of the final day of my 18th year on Earth, I will fulfill my destiny. I'm not running away, Mr. Grass. I'm trying to return home. And if I can't find a way back to hell in the next few hours, then there will be no stopping what follows. Mr. Grass? Mr. Grass? <laughs> okay, so Glass is still alive. That's good. And if Wee Ming doesn't get to hell, she's gonna wipe out all of humanity. That's bad. Anyway, back to Hannah. We've got plenty more demons to deal with, but the good news is that we actually don't have to kill any of them. So we're just gonna roll around the downstairs of the building until we eventually reach the meat locker. This kinda takes a little while for uh, reasons. Once we get to the meat locker, bad news, it's locked. On the bright side though, the key is located in the changing room right beside it, where not only do we get the key, but we get to change back into an outfit that while not ideally suited for a freezer, is no doubt better than the previous option. Now once we uh, navigate around the demon in this room and uh, navigate around the demons near the freezer, we're finally almost out of here. Well shit, maybe Glass is dead after all. At least he left his shotgun behind as a parting gift. Somehow he knew just what a girl needed. Anyway, let's follow the sounds of the buzzsaw in the distance, cause I'm sure that'll be good. I'm very impressed with your audacity, child. Or is it a lack of emotion masquerading as courage? Hmm, is that how you can kill so many Mayun? Be without emotion, like when you used your body to escape me, yes? <laughs> but poor little Mayu. <laughs> Jin wouldn't help you leave until he'd had his taste. I always <laughs> thought you were bitch from hell. Then, as you die, take some small comfort in knowing that you were right. <laughs> Hey look, it's Madame Shen, which means it's time for another boss fight. Surprisingly, considering everything we've been through so far and the number of demons running around during this fight, this might be one of the easier bosses in the game. So you see this blue fire around Madame Shen. As long as this is in front of her, we can't damage her. Although when you kill these demons, they drop paper dolls of Madame Shen, and if you use these dolls on the blue flame, you can then damage Madame Shen for a brief period. Nice and easy. That being said, I still did die my first time on this boss because the demons can kill Wee Ming and let me tell you, kill her they will, so uh, make sure to keep an eye on her and you'll probably be fine. You have no idea the hell that awaits you. The hell that awaits the world once we make flowers into full potential. Soon you'll know me. So very soon. <laughs> My name is Hana! I am a perfect mirror, Hana. When they look at me, 
They see the true evil within themselves. An evil that can no longer be suppressed. An evil given form and purpose. This is a one-way trip, Hana. I've come this far. Might as well get my money's worth. Okay, so, uh, guess we're going to hell. Why did you suspect Madame Chen? She knew my father. She never changed. When I found out the truth about his wealth, I figured maybe she was interested in more than money. Everybody wants something Yim La Wong can offer. That's what makes him powerful. But why you? I do not know yet, but I intend to find out. There are horrors waiting for us here, Hana. I can sense them. I can feel their desire to reach us, to reach me. It's like I'm coming home. Don't worry, Weeming. We'll stay close. Oh! Weeming? Well, shit. That's got to be a new record for losing Wee Ming, and to some ominous black goo, no less. Anyway, here we are, the underworld. I gotta say, as far as video game journeys go, cyberpunk Hong Kong to zombie-infested fishing village to demon-infested brothel, and then finally literal hell, it's, uh, well, it's out there, that's for sure. Also, listen to how grim this place sounds. Now, I don't know about you, but I certainly wouldn't want to fall into that black stuff. Oh no, Hannah. I am so, so sorry. Alrighty, so straight away, we gotta time our moves across a few platforms, and now we can finally start our journey into the depths of hell. And I mean, big props to Kronos for these environments. I still think Neo Hong Kong is more memorable for me as a setting, but this place certainly looks like a place where evil dead people would hang out, that's for sure. Not long into this area, we come across a little village, and also our main enemies for this area, who are these ghouly folks that move kind of weirdly. You'll get used to seeing them throughout this disc, don't you worry. So this village area kind of acts like a central hub for the underworld. There's a save point here too, which we're going to make good use out of, but more importantly, located just to the left of the village, there is a bonfire. Now the bonfires are a brand new mechanic exclusive to this disc of the game. Now you may have noticed earlier when we kill the enemies in this area, they drop ammo, but not regular ammo. Instead, they drop paper ammo. Paper ammo in its basic form is entirely useless, and would you believe, it's also the only type of ammo we're gonna get in this area. Although, if you bring your paper ammo to a fire, like this bonfire over here, you can then burn it and turn it into regular ammo. So in other words, to get ammo on this disc, you need to essentially cash in your stored paper ammo at set points, meaning ammo management is a little bit more important in this disc than before, and considering how good my ammo management has been prior to this, you know this spells disaster for my future, and likely lots of rolling too. So hell is another relatively open area. I guess the best way to describe it is that there's two long pathways, one to the left and one to the right, and then in the middle we have that village we first appeared in. I decided to try out the left pathway first, which of course is the wrong way to go, but it sure does have some eye-catching sights, so it's not all bad. Anyway, as we roll back and go the correct way, we come across a lot of things that we can't interact with just yet. So as usual, we're just going to keep moving and shooting ghouls until eventually we find something we can interact with. And let me tell you, there are a lot of ghouls on the way. Although on the bright side, one of these ghouls drops something called the paper gate. What is the paper gate, you ask? Well, it's like a key, but instead of using it on a door, we got to burn it first and then the door opens. So back to the bonfire we go. On the way back, we come across the other common enemy for this location, these skinless hook hand demons. They like to jump off screen and reappear somewhere else, which is very annoying and often makes me waste ammo, so uh, fuck these guys. Anyway, back at the bonfire, we burn the paper gate to open up a new pathway, but of course, Doing so also spawns a bunch of the hook hand demons, and look, these guys really might be the most annoying enemies in the game, and this area is gonna throw a lot of them at you. Now, while it would be nice to get rid of them, i found that the amount of ammo it takes for me to kill them often isn't worth the amount of ammo that they drop. That, and I also kept dying at them. 
Here's the game over screen for hell, by the way, just in case you were wondering. So you know what? We're just going to do things the old fashioned way. Just roll away from our problems and save our ammo for when we really need it. Now, you may think this tactic is kind of cheap and cheesy, but I really can't stress enough how many goddamn enemies this game is going to drop on you from here on out. So don't feel bad. Just roll away from your problems. No one's going to mind. So we make it to that door we burned open. And would you look at that? Madam Shen is still kicking. See what you've done to me, Mei Yun. See how failure is punished. You did this to yourself, Chen. Your greed, your vanity, perhaps. Maybe I hurt you in the past, Mei Yun. But I can help you in the now. What are you talking about? My daughter. You may have seen her already, yes. Take this to her. She is alone and afraid, and I cannot reach her. This is my torment. Take the doll. My daughter knows much about you. Take the doll and I will help you when you return. Alright, so Madame Shen wants us to find her daughter and give her this doll. Hell's probably not the best place to leave a child, but then again, I'm not a demon, so what do I know? Anyway, a short bit of rolling later, we come across another save point, and maybe the creepiest room in the whole game. Although that being said, if you were to leave a child in hell, this is probably the room to keep him in. Here, I brought you your doll. This isn't my doll. This is our doll. <gasps> oh my, this can't be. Don't you recognize us, Mei Yun? You were so happy at this age, remember? Then mommy and daddy died and all we had left was this doll. You're me? Yes, before you became Hana. Before you had to run from your past. But you can't run from me, I'm always with you. And I have a secret that will help you. Tell me. You know it too. It's in your mind. Unless you're afraid to find it. I'm not afraid. Good. Do you ever miss me, Hana? Do, do you ever miss being Mayun? Yes. Then here's your chance to find us again. Listen, Hana. As a child, we flowered like a branch under the rain. As a child, we flowered like a branch under the rain. So in a twist, it turns out the kid here is actually Hannah herself, which means it's time for maybe one of the coolest puzzles in the game, the age puzzle. So when we talk to Hannah, she gives us a sort of code which is to be used as a hint. Now beside her to the right, there is a clock with a series of numbers on it and also a dial with the numbers 1 through 5. What do we do with that dial you may ask? Well, if we look to the wall just to the left of little Hannah, we get a series of code words each with an assigned number. Now, if you remember what little Hannah said to us a moment ago, as a child, we flowered like a branch under the rain. Well, if we look at the list of words, we can see flowered under the number five and also branch under the number one. So what we need to do is move the number five and then number one under the number that represents the age of the character we're talking to. So in this case, young Hannah is five years old. So turn the dial to five and one under the number five. Hit enter, and hey presto, we're on to the next segment, with an older Hannah and a brand new code to solve. Once you figure out the gimmick to this puzzle, it's actually pretty easy to solve, but it's such a weird and strangely haunting puzzle. You get to talk to older and older versions of yourself, not to mention the fact that you're also in a child's playroom in hell with some toys constantly going off in the background. And when you solve the final part of the puzzle, this also happens. I told you, Hana. The answer was inside our head. I'm not afraid. Yeah, while I wouldn't really call Fear Effect a scary game, some of its visuals are the most fucked up you'll see in any PS1 game, let me tell you. Anyway, now that we got the object that fell out of dead Hannah's skull, let's roll on back to Madame Shen, shall we? A gift. A thank you, Mayun, for looking in on my daughter. Did you like what you see? I'm not your daughter. Oh, but you were once my girl, Mayun. Mayun is dead. You killed her. My name is Hana. Nothing was taken from you that you weren't willing to give Mei Yun. You fool only yourself to believe differently. <laughs> Damn, I sure do hate when people turn into the whole tree ghouls thing. How rude. At least she did give us a stick for our troubles. 
That's nice. Anyway, since we actually had to use some bullets there, we have pretty much no ammo. So we better go back to the bonfire and start burning whatever paper ammo we do have. We've even got a paper assault rifle in our inventory. Kudos to whoever went to the effort of putting that together. An origami master, that's for sure. So, good news, burning that stick we just got now gives us the ability to light the other torches around the area, which doesn't just give us some new places to burn paper, but also lets us access a new area once we light all three of them. So, let's head there, why don't we? Beautiful, isn't it? Oh, put that away. You cannot kill what does not live. <laughs> Are you Yimla Wong? Me, the king of hell. No, no, no. War, what I am is not important. What matters only is what I can do for you. Where's Wee Ming? When it is time, you will find her. And Yimla Wong as well. <laughs> Take this and see my brother. Now go. We are preparing for a funeral. <laughs> Okay, so Spooky Tongue Man doesn't just spawn some hook demons on us, but he also gives us half of a stone tree monument, and also a paper gate key, and as I'm sure you all know by now, that means we're gonna be rolling back to the bonfire. Now, in spite of how little enemies I was killing, mostly due to my severe ammo shortages, I also started to realize that I was collecting a bunch of paper machine gun ammo, which is ammo for the machine pistol, a weapon that I did not have. I thought maybe it was something I'd find later on, but as it turns out, I never will. I must have missed the weapon somewhere in hell or in a previous chapter, but uh, let me just say, if you play this game, make sure you find that goddamn machine pistol, because the ammo issues I experienced because of it, they aren't going to go away anytime soon. So burning the next paper key causes a real key to spawn in one of the village huts. This key allows us to gain entry to a red gate just beside the age puzzle that we previously solved, and... Considering how long it took me to open the freezer while rolling, I'm more than happy to use some of our precious ammo to make opening this door all the more easier for me. Well, that's probably not good. Oh shit, glass is alive. Fuck yeah. ready to play as a pissed off one arm glass in hell. I know I am. Also fair play to the man for climbing down this thing with one arm, that's legitimately impressive. Anyway, it's glass time, and if you thought disc 4 was the void of the old character swapping, you're sorely mistaken. Instead, we get to explore an entirely new area of hell, the ice caves, complete with spooky ghosts and walls that uh, bleed. Of course, it's not long until we're back in combat with some more hellish enemies, but thankfully, in spite of glass lacking an arm and the paper ammo gimmick continuing down here, ammo is much less of a problem for glass, so there won't be anywhere near as much rolling down here. That being said, the next room introduces us to a very deadly hell dog enemy, so we are still going to roll around a little bit, at least to start figuring out its attack patterns. Just past the dog room, we reach a dead end, but find both the moon key and a paper machine gun for our trouble. Oh, what I wouldn't do to find one of them with Hannah. Now the cave itself, while having a few areas to explore, isn't quite as large and windy as the area of hell that we explored with Hannah. In fact, the only direction we can really go from here is blocked by a moon door, so we might as well get some use out of that key that we just found. Through here, we get another glimpse of that ghost and come across another door with a symbol, which I'm going to assume requires the sun key. If we go around this corner, we get a brief cutscene where Glass seemingly regrets going around said corner, so let's take out some of the ghouls and get some ammo for our trouble. By the way, in case you're wondering, the ammo spot in this map is the little torch right outside the moon key door, so let's consider this area kind of the hub zone for now. Anyway, back around the corner, and once again Glass is jumped by some aggressive ghouls. Just gonna roll myself into a good position. Any second now? Ah, whatever, that's good enough. In this area, we come across a cool talking dragon. I am Thorlo, dragon of fire. 
I have no doubt this thing is going to be used in a puzzle at some point, so let's make a note of him for later. After here, we reach a save point, and yet another incredibly impressive glass climbing section. Alright, so that ghost is 100% Deke. I don't know if the fancy suit gave it away earlier, but the split open head sure gives it away now. Down in this area, we come across another two dogs, although it's nothing a little machine pistol fire can't handle. In the middle of this room, we find two more of those elemental dragons, the dragons of earth and heaven to be exact, and also the sun key. Now, even though there's a path forward from here, I'm afraid of missing out on any guns or ammo, so let's backtrack to that sun door from earlier and see if it has anything worth our while. Okay, so we got a weird room with some enemies in it, but we also get access to a paper assault rifle and the mountain dragon, so yeah, 100% worth the backtracking. Anyway, back down to the previous room and up some vines this time around, which uh, Deke is waiting for us on the top of... That's not creepy at all. After here, we get to an area with a cool cracked FMV floor where we also get ganked by a bunch of ghouls. Once again, kudos to Glass for managing to keep a steady aim while using an assault rifle with one hand. What a chat. Just past here, we find our final dragon, the Dragon of Water, and also another save point and some vines to journey even deeper into hell. Once we get down here, we can interact with this mirror on the left, which shows us a series of images that clearly represent the dragons we just walked by. These no doubt represent a specific order to do something, and we are about to find out exactly what that means. So shortly on from here, we come across our next puzzle section, this floor. And in one of the meanest moments of the entire game, they show you exactly how the floor works by luring you in with an ammo pickup. <laughs> Thanks Kronos, really funny guys. Although check it out, the cave gets an exclusive game over screen too. Nice work Kronos, I still hate you for the ammo trap though. Alright, so remember those dragons we just walked by? When I was talking to them, I noted down a few things. The order in which I seen them, their colours, the names and the elements that they represented. Turns out most of that information is in fact entirely useless. What I should have been paying attention to instead was the markings at the very bottom of the statues. These markings match up with the floor tiles in this section and you're meant to follow the order that was seen in the mirror to then safely walk across the path. Now at first I thought I could just kind of wing it instead of walking back to all the dragons. That uh, didn't go very well. So instead, I remember that I just so happened to be recording footage for a YouTube video and opted to watch that back instead. And yeah, that made things a whole lot easier. Once we get across, we gain access to the stone sword item, which means it's time to retrace our steps and make it back in one piece. Thankfully, it's a little easier this time since the path is clear to us, but it's also a lot harder since they added a bunch of angry ghouls into the mix. Thanks, Kronos. After we try that again with a much better weapon, we're soon back in business. That means it's time for some more backtracking, which of course means some more surprise enemies along the way. Hey look, the jank is back. Frankly, it's been too long. This room here is actually kind of tricky, but if you walk back a bit and give yourself some space, it does become a whole lot more manageable. We get paid another visit from Spooky Ghost Deke and work our way back to the moon door to finally cash in on all that paper ammo we've had weighing us down. Now, I'm not really sure where exactly I need to use this stone sword. I tried using it on some of the dragons we came by, but that doesn't really seem to do anything. But if you wander all the way back to where the cave begins, we come across this weird dragon that I missed the first time around. Stick the stone sword in him, and hey presto, we get to move on. Good. God had nothing to do with this. What you see before you was made every time I pulled the trigger. Now when you see your true self, Glass, you'll understand. Oh, shit. I'm sorry, Nick. Sorry? <laughs> do you realize what they do to killers like us here, eh? You're bleeding sorry? You brought this deal to me. I trusted you to cover the angles, yeah? You'll enjoy your last breath, Glass, because your eternity is about to start, and it's gonna be horrifying. Well, that's mildly terrifying, but more importantly, it's time for one of the coolest bosses in the game, Demon Deke. Now, when I say coolest, I mean visually. The gameplay part, while cool in theory, is also maybe one of the most awkward fights in the whole game. 
So our old buddy Deke here, for the majority of the battle he will take the form of this FMV goo that moves around these platforms. Our job is to dodge this goo and take some shots at Deke whenever he returns to his non gooey form. The fight itself is broken up into parts, once you deal enough damage to Deke, the formation of the platforms change and it gets a little tougher each time, get hit by the goo a bit too much, and well, this happens. Yeah, not great. Now the reason this is tough is down to a mixture of the tank controls and how unpredictable the goo is. You can kind of get a vibe for which way it's coming, but that still doesn't mean you'll always be able to react to it in time. Either way, even with the issues, this is still one of the best bosses in the game, and really not all that difficult to take down once you get the hang of things. Rest easy. I'll make them pay for this. You have my word. Man, Disc 4 really loves giving you items that come out of people's heads, don't they? Oh hey look, we're back to Hannah. Almost forgot about her there for a moment. Time for a quick save and we're immediately back into the Hook Demons. Nice, I miss those guys. Once we move up the pathway into the throne room, we meet the negative version of the Tongue Man, who then gives us the other half of that tree amulet, as well as a crank. You might remember us passing by a well earlier in the disc, very likely the same well Glass was interacting with moments ago, so let's head there and give that crank a try. Unsurprisingly, the journey there was filled with a lot of rolling and hook demons. Anyway, now that we're here, let's crank it up. Glass in the well alert. Anyway, time for a very important cutscene. Weeming! Weeming! I'm here! I'm over here! Weeming behind you! Yeah! Glass, you're alive. But why? Why'd you do Look that? Look at me, Anna. You see what happened to me? What about Deke, huh? She was the cause. I'm sorry, Hannah, but I had to end this. Only I can end huh? this. Huh? I told you, Hannah. I need your help to return to hell. Let her speak. You draw on me, Hana? You better be prepared for the consequences. With all that we've witnessed, if we don't help her, then the world as we know it ceases. But maybe she can stop this prophecy no. from being fulfilled. Don't make me drop you, Hana. Hana! Hana! I'm going after her, Glass. Shoot me if you must. Oh shit, it was glass all along. What a twist. To be fair, if somebody cut off my arm and killed my Australian buddy, I'd be pretty pissed too. Probably not pissed enough to cut a girl's throat, but still, I'd be very, very upset. Caught up in the commotion, Wee Ming gets swept away into the crowd and Hannah decides to run after her. This kind of leaves glass in a sticky situation. Okay, maybe I was underselling how bad a situation it really was, but nothing a little rolling can sort, I'm sure. Mr. Glass? <laughs> Honestly, Mr. Lamb cannot miss with the one-liners. What a man. So back we go to Hannah, once again rolling away from our problems, assuming our problems are nice enough to move out of the way, that is. Seriously, rolling is so OP in this game. Where would I be without it? Anyway, now that we're back to the area we incorrectly visited at the beginning of the disc, it's time for another puzzle. A puzzle that utilizes the remaining items in our inventory. This is another easy puzzle once you know what to do. You see this map in front of us? This basically represents the underworld area we've been running around as Hannah. You can see some landmarks here like the bonfire and the tree torches, 
Well, the goal here is just to match up the four items with the locations that we found them in. Click on the item, then click on the location. Nice and easy. And uh, yeah, bit of an anti-climax, but that's the end of disc four. So back to disc two, I guess. Yeah, so remember the way I said each disc basically represents its own section of the game? Well, for the most part, that is true. The only outlier is disc two, which also secretly holds the final act of the game, stored away in a little corner of the disc somewhere. Anyway, here we are in probably the most visually impressive location in the game, the creepy spinning room. In here, we have another fire pit, and since we seem to have a paper doll in our inventory, we might as well burn it, which of course drops a few of our favorite enemies into the mix. Just as a side note, I really love the audio design in this place. It simultaneously sounds really creepy and also kind of beautiful in a way. Anyway, this room right here isn't just pretty cool, the room itself is in fact the game's final puzzle. You might notice we still have those tree items that we used on the map. Well, if we look near the fire pit, you'll notice these Chinese characters just above an image of each of these items. So, it may not come as a surprise to you that we need to find these characters in the floor and walls and then use the required item when it's visible. Of course, due to the nature of the room and how it, uh keeps shifting. I guess you could say this is a little easier said than done. But hey, once you know what you're doing, it's relatively straightforward. Okay, now that we solved that, it's time for the end of the game. Hana! Oh, oh dearest! Hana! Oh! Jin? <laughs> I would prefer if you address me by my true name. <laughs> Jin Lao Wong. Yes, Hana. I am the king of hell. You want answers? Yes. Hell is full, Hana. <laughs> As fast as they can be judged, Morkan, they stand before my mirror, a mirror so perfect it reflects their soul. And they are transformed into what they see. But I can no longer condemn them into the levels of hell, because there is no room left. <laughs> Wee Ming is my solution. When men look into her eyes, they will also see their souls. It will be as if they looked into my mirror. You set me up from the beginning. I was so disappointed that you never questioned why Wee Ming's power transformed others in your presence while you remained unaffected. The rooftop. Your blood. <laughs> the only antidote for Wee Ming's gift. But why? I was testing you, Mei Yun. I need someone to look after Wee Ming while she completes her destiny. Someone without mercy. What have you done with her? Where's Wee Ming? Wee Ming is back in hell. You've <laughs> lost. You think this is hell? Oh, Mei Yun, you cannot begin to imagine. We've come this far. Help me get the rest of the way, Hana. I can stop the prophecy. I can do this. My heart is strong. Oh, you mean? You have no heart? I created you the same way as Lamb's wealth. You began as a burning piece of paper. Right here. And you, Lamb, have failed me. No! No! No!
Let's kill them all! No, I believe Weeping Glass, and I won't let you stop her. Don't get in my way, Hana. <laughs> Yeah, so in a twist I genuinely didn't see coming, Jin, our sniveling little buddy who got shot out of the window all the way back at the beginning of the game, is in fact the king of hell. And he also orchestrated this whole thing as a test to see if Hana was capable of helping Wee Ming fulfill her destiny to destroy humanity. A pretty elaborate plan there, I'd expect nothing less from the king of hell to be fair. But more importantly, this leads us to another twist. The choice to side with Hannah and save Wee Ming, or the choice to side with Glass and just kill everybody. Now not only does this change the ending of the game, but it also leads to one of two completely different final bosses, which is uh, pretty cool, not gonna lie. Now if I had to pick one, I'd probably go with Hannah, because I feel like that would be the canon choice, right? So let's see how picking her pans out. Goodbye, my friend. Hana, delay Yin La Wong until I am gone. Hurry! <laughs> oh shit, she actually killed Glass. What the hell? Anyway, I guess it's time to fight Hannah's final boss, the demon version of Mr. Lam. The fight is rather visually impressive, I think you'll agree. Now ironically, in spite of this being the final boss of the game, I found this fight to be one of the easier bosses. Maybe it was because at this point I was actually somewhat decent at the game, but let's be fair, deep down inside I know I'm still trash, so it must actually just be kinda easy. The goal here is to simply dodge the lightning that Lam fires across the ground and focus on killing these flying demons that appear. Once the demons drop some paper money, we need to burn out one of the torches on the right or left of the screen, which then damages the boss. Once we do that three times, that's the fight pretty much done. Now just for clarity, the game actually has a bonus bad ending if you lose this fight, and ironically, this is one of the very few bosses in the game that I didn't die to, so yeah, I missed out on that the first time true, but just to make sure I've covered my bases, I came back in and died on purpose, just to let you see what Hannah's bad ending actually looked like, so here it is. What choice did I have? None, really. And maybe when this is over? We'll create a better world than the one we have. Yeah, the bad ending is Hannah becoming Wee Ming's bodyguard after all. That sucks. But hey, one more token game over screen for the road, so that's fun. Anyway, now that we've showed the bad ending, let's see what Hannah's good ending actually looks like. change, Hannah. I hope I don't see you again. Farewell. The prophecy! You've ruined everything! Not yet, Jim. There. Now I've ruined everything. Okay. That was a little better, I guess, but uh, all their friends are dead, so that kind of sucks. Alrighty then, let's see what happens if we pick Glass instead. Maybe things turn out a little better in this timeline. Ah, oh, come on! I never expected that we would end like this, Hana. You may have fooled Hana, but not me. Oh, Mr. Glass, how do you like me now? Okay, so this time around we get to fight Demon Wee Ming instead. Not as cool a fight as Hannah's, but still pretty cool all things considered. This fight is a little more straightforward than Hannah's as all we have to do is just unload on the boss instead of burning anything. The hard part is just dealing with the demons that Wee Ming spawns to distract us. Honestly, another very easy fight that once again, I didn't die on. So before we check in on what happens when we win, first why don't we see what happens if we lose. <laughs> The prophecy was complete. There was no need to avoid the blood any longer. I am among you now. 
It's only a matter of time until our eyes make contact. I wonder what you will see. Welp, that's not great. Cool eyes though, I suppose. Okay, let's check out Glass's good ending. Our last chance for some semblance of positivity after all of this. I killed everything that was left in the brothel. When I couldn't shoot, I burned. I figured it was the least I could do for Hana and Deke. I knew things would be looking up. In fact, I felt like I had a world of opportunities in the palm of my hand. All right, that kind of sucked too. What gives? So uh, remember at the beginning of the game when I mentioned the difficulty toggle? Well, it turns out to unlock the game's true ending, you actually need to beat the game on hard. Now, I don't know about you guys, but since I struggled uh, just a little bit on normal, and from what I can tell, hard mode does two things. It makes enemies tankier, and it also gives you less ammo for your weapons. In other words, basically my nightmare. Now, I do want to give you guys the full experience, but I would also like to avoid severe depression. So, we're just going to borrow this clip from the internet and show you what does happen during the hard mode ending. You better be right, huh? I know. Mayun, you've come a long way to disappoint me. Go! Get to the tile! I'll take care of you! And just in case you were wondering, the Hana boss fight is in fact the canon final boss. And since it is unchanged on hard from the one that we've just seen, we're gonna skip right ahead to the conclusion. I will repay you for the sacrifices you have made. And I will never forget you, Hana. You ruined everything! You meddling bitch! Until you met me, you were just a whore! That's no way to talk to my friend. Even if you are a kid. Yeah, fuck him up, Glass. Hey, mate. Anna. I'll be there. I seem to have taken one on the noggin. I can't remember much. You kept your word, Wee Ming. You repaid the sacrifice. Right. So, how'd we make out on this deal, then? I'd say we did okay. Wouldn't you, Glass? Yeah, we did fine. Just fine. Now look, when I tell you that I nearly jumped out of my seat, at the sight of Deke not only inexplicably coming back to life, but coming back to life while sitting on a toilet of all things. Now that, that's what I call a happy ending. So yeah, that's Fear Effect. Genuinely one of the craziest games I have ever played. This whole thing from start to finish was such a memorable experience. Maybe. One of the wildest trips you can take on the PS1, just in terms of the places it takes you, the things it shows you, and just how absolutely bonkers this game can be. Now, I want to stress, right, that while I really enjoyed the game and will proudly gush over its visuals and presentation, Fear Effect no doubt has a lot of problems. To say this game is a bit frustrating at times is really underselling how goddamn frustrating this game can be at times. The inventory system or lack thereof is an annoying mess, the game requiring you to dodge tricky timed FMV obstacles while utilizing some janky ass tank controls, the really inconsistent fear meter slash health system, the fact a whole lot of this game is pure trial and error which is going to result in you dying a lot while playing this thing for the first time, sometimes it'll be your fault, sometimes it's just cause the game really wants to fuck you over, especially during the bosses and let me tell you, I really didn't highlight it enough during the playthrough, but you were gonna spend a lot of time loading back to save points and retrying things over again. If there was ever a game I could recommend playing with save states if possible, if you respect your time and want to enjoy this game to the fullest, trust me, 
Use save states. Sitting around waiting for a load screen after every death doesn't make you more of a gamer. I don't care what you say. Really when it comes down to it, on a pure gameplay level, Fear Effect as a tank control survival horror slash action game is really just kind of mediocre at best. But at the same time, Fear Effect is one of those really rare cases where the game's style, its atmosphere, its characters, the story, all these aspects of the game elevated to being really good in spite of its gameplay flaws. All that annoying stuff I just mentioned, I can 100% live with that. You know why? Because this game is just so fucking cool. Fear Effect is such a unique experience on the console that even to this day, as a newcomer trying it out for the first time in 2022, it left my jaw on the floor. Sure, I would have liked its story and characters to have been fleshed out a bit more, but really I can think of few games on the platform where I like the characters this much. And not only that, the game gives us a genuinely gory and adult plot with some very heavy moments and twists that I really didn't see coming at all, especially that deke on the toilet moment. I'm glad he is alive, but seriously, what the hell happened there? It's telling that as soon as I finished this game, I immediately wanted to jump into the sequel, Retro Helix, not for the gameplay, but because I wanted to see more and learn more about these characters and their histories, and the good news is that Retro Helix, plot-wise, actually takes place before the original Fear Effect, offering us some insight into the origins of these characters. So. I for one really can't wait to dive into that and believe me we'll get to that and some of the uh, other Fear Effect games down the line but I think this video has probably gone on long enough as it is so we'll leave Retro Helix and its uh, questionable advertising for another day. But before we finish up I do want to briefly talk about one more thing and that's Fear Effect Reinvented, a remaster of the original Fear Effect that was revealed all the way back in 2017. This remaster aimed to be true to the original, both story and gameplay wise, only now with some improvements to the movement and inventory system, and probably most importantly of all, the removal of the FMV, with the game and its world being entirely rebuilt using more traditional 3D graphics. Now understandably, fans of the series were very excited for this remake of Fear Effect, but uh, a lot of time has passed since 2017 and the game just kind of seems to be in limbo nowadays. The developer of this project was a Polish studio by the name of Forever Entertainment who kind of specializes in these modern remakes of classic titles. They're actually the team responsible for the Panzer Dragoon remake which I personally thought was done really well and around the time this video comes out their remake of the original House of the Dead should also be released. So. Clearly remaking old games is right up their alley, but the Fear Effect remake was announced long before these projects came out and with there being almost complete silence on Reinvented over these past few years, it's kind of safe to assume it's either cancelled or just stuck in limbo for the foreseeable future. Now, I don't want to ruffle any feathers here, but after playing through the original Fear Effect, I actually think the cancellation of this game might be a good thing, and before you call me a big dumb idiot, at least let me tell you why. So Fear Effect, in my opinion, is a very special video game and a big part of what makes it special isn't the gameplay itself, right? The gameplay in many ways is actually quite janky and outdated, even by PS1 standards. Now, you can update many aspects of the game in a remake, things like the movement and aiming, the inventory system, hell, even add a nice quick save function to make dying less of a drag, yeah? Well, even if you do all of that, I think the game still wouldn't hold up all that well to a modern lens. Fear Effect as a game really isn't all that great. What makes it great is how incredible its visuals are and how unique the utilization of FMV is within the game itself. Fear Effect constantly wowed me because of how different it was as a gaming experience. This blend of cinematic platformer, FMV and tank control action game, all these things come together to make Fear Effect a game that's more than the sum of its parts. It's these aspects that make Fear Effect cool and memorable. If you were to isolate the gameplay itself and then remove all the things that make it special and just give it some fancy HD graphics and lighting, 
Well then you remove the heart and soul of Fear Effect itself. A good example of this is a recent remake of the beloved classic 13, an incredibly stylish FPS that pays homage to its source material by utilising this striking comic inspired visual style. And the visuals are absolutely the first thing you think of when you remember this game, right? Well in the 2020 remake they mimicked the gameplay alright, but replace the visual style with this generic modern look to the point where it could be just any 3D game and well, I think the critical and commercial response speaks for itself. In my humble opinion, I think Fear Effect Reinvented would have had a similar reception to the 13 remake and I think Forever Entertainment might have picked up on this at some point during development and opted to quietly shelve it instead. Now, it's not 100% officially cancelled, but let's be real, I don't think it's coming back anytime soon, especially after the reaction to Sedna, but uh, yeah, that's a story for another time. But hey, if you want to try something new, the original E3 demo for Fear Factor just got archived on the net, so if you like, you can see what the game was like in its early days. Look, it even had a regular health bar. How quaint. So yeah, that was a really long video about Fear Effect, a game that, in spite of its issues, I really think is too cool not to try. It's easily wormed its way into being one of my favourites on the console, and I'm only disappointed in myself for not trying it sooner. If you'd like to hear even more of my thoughts on Fear Effect, uh somehow. The wonderful folks over at the Back of the Rack podcast had me on recently to talk about our experiences with the game. The hosts Bendez and Sandy have some great in-depth discussions about obscure and lesser known games on the channel, so if you like cool people talking about cool games, I highly recommend you check out their stuff. Anyway, until next time, thank you so much for watching. I hope you're all keeping well, and most importantly of all, Stuart Little 2 is actually not that bad. There, I said it. 6 out of 10. Hey look, it's the end of the video, so a special thank you to all the lovely Patreon subscribers you see on the screen below you. Thank you so much for helping to keep the channel going. I also want to give a special shout out to Alan Castlin, Crimson Cyclist, Globe99, Moomatron, and finally Moomin Biscuit, Trans Rights Are Human Rights, who all subscribed at the Fan++ tier. Much love to you all.